So we're continuing with our SAT practice. As always, I recommend pausing the video and attempting the problems before you see the solution or solutions. So give this problem a shot. Okay, so in here, Katarina is a botanist studying the production of pears by two types of pear trees. She noticed that type A trees produced 20% more pears than type B trees did. Based on Katarina's observation, if the type A trees produced 144 pairs, how many pairs do the type B trees produce? Okay, so this one, it's there's a lot of stuff going on here. It's a very easy problem to do computationally, but it's also very easy to mess up. Basically, are you going up or going down is what the, what the problem is going to be. So it says, Type A trees produce 20% more pairs than type B trees. I would recommend writing an equation saying, okay, type A produced 20% more. So that's going to be 120%, so 1.2 of type B trees. This is one option. Okay, if um, type A trees produce 144 pairs, then I can just plug it in here and get 144 equals 1.2b. I can go to my calculator, do a little bit of division, do 144 divided by 1.2, and I get 120 pairs. Now that's one option. Um, I like this option. It's, sort of, it's quick, it's easy, it's direct. Uh, the Another option that might be better for those of you if you're a little bit unsure about how to solve this problem is the following. First, make sure you understand which one is bigger. So based on your type A produced more than type B, so A is bigger. Next thing, I know that A is 144 pairs. Now, if you're having trouble with this idea, you should know how to get 20% of these numbers. So I can actually just do 20% of each of these and add on. So I can do either 0 0.2 times 115, which would give me um, 23. And then 115 plus 23 will give me 138. That's not 144. This is the wrong answer. I could also, um, instead of doing sort of 0 0.2 times 120, and getting 24, I could have done a ratio. Say, okay, 20%, 20 over 100 is some number out of 144. And if I cross multiply or multiply this way, either way, I got X is 24. And then it says more, so add it on. So 120 plus 24 is 144. That's why 120 is my answer. Um, the most likely mistake I would expect to see is someone that instead of um, dividing by the 1.2 or starting from here and going there, they'll do 20% more than this, and that's gonna lead you to 173 pairs. Okay, give this problem a shot. All right, a square field measures 10 meters by 10 meters. Um, 10 students mark, uh, 10 students each mark off a randomly selected region in the field. Um, each region is a square and has a side length of one meter, and no two regions overlap. The students count the earthworms contained in the soil to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground surface in each region. The results are shown in the table below. So we have these regions. Which of the following is a reasonable approximation of the number of earthworms to a depth of five centimeters beneath the ground surface? in the entire field. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. This is a very um, sort of loose problem, but what's happening is we have this square. I'm not gonna break it up all the way. Maybe I can, so we break it up. Uh, sure, break it up. So 10 by 10, isn't that lovely? And these 10 different students each pick a square. So let's say A checks this square, B, checks this square C, checks this square D, checks this square. What we're doing is we're getting a, um, we're getting a uh, theoretical probability. 
we're getting a, an example of how you'd expect. So, um, if I wanted to do this the most mathematically accurate way that I could with this information, what I would do is I would add all these numbers. And then I would find the sample mean by dividing it by how many um, numbers are in the sample. So divided by 10. And I'll actually do that, but this is not necessary. I can do this actually much easier. Let's see if I can type and do it. So, oh, lovely. I can type 107 plus 147 plus 146 plus 135 plus 149 plus. 141 plus 150 plus 154 plus 176 plus 166. Okay, and divide that by 10, and I get 147.1. So to my to the best of my estimating, I would expect to see 147.1 earthworms to a depth of five centimeters in each one of these one by one squares. There are, and this is the next part that's going to cause problems, there are 10 times 10 um, of these squares. So I would expect the biggest mistake is going to be someone multiplying this by 10. I should actually multiply 147.1 multiplied by 100, the area, how many total squares there are. And by doing that, I will get... Fourteen thousand seven hundred ten, which is closest to fifteen thousand. Now, my argument: I don't need to do that because I can probably just glance at these numbers, say, "Okay, all right, all right, I see these numbers, I see these numbers, all right, wonderful," um, and say, "Okay, they're all close to 140, 150. I know that I have a hundred of these boxes. That this hundred here is sort of critical, critical. Um, and so, if I do that times a hundred. I get my answer straight away without having to do all of this computation. All right, give this problem a shot. So here we have a system system of inequalities, and we have the Cartesian plane with the quadrants marked off. It says if the system of inequalities y is greater than or equal to two x plus one, and y is greater than one half x minus one is graphed here, which contains no solutions. So let me go through and graph this. So it's going to be a little bit sketchy, but it'll work. So I will start with my y intercept here. I will graph a slope of two, so up two over one down to left one. And since I have a greater than or equal to, I will have a solid line. Since I am greater than or equal to, I will have solutions above that line. So there is my first constraint. Now, I probably know the answer already because the only quadrant that is has nothing in here um, is quadrant 4. But let's look at the next one. Okay, so in this one, let's change that to green, sure. Um, we have y is greater than 1 half x minus 1. So I go to my y intercept of minus 1, and then I'll go up 1 over 2, up 1 over 2, down 1, left 2. And since this is a strict inequality, I will have a dotted line. And again, since we're greater than, I'm going to have answers above this. And the only portion, I'll do this in red, that they overlap, because this is uh, this and that, is this, I'll call it a quarter space, that's I guess a good enough description of it, is this region here. This is where all of our solutions are. If I have any number in this red shade region, let's say for instance the point zero 0.05, 
if I put that in here, is 5 greater than or equal to 0 plus 1, well, it sure as heck is, is 5 greater than 0 minus 1, it sure as heck is. So those work out wonderfully. If I try a point that is not in this red region, like 0, 0, so 0, 0 is in the green, but not also in the blue, I can say, okay, is 0 greater than or equal to 0 plus 1? And the answer is no. 0 is actually less than 1. So this one does not work. And now looking, red, it has some stuff in quadrant 1, some stuff in quadrant 2, some solutions in quadrant 3, but it has nothing in quadrant 4, so the only one that contains no solutions is quadrant 4. All right, give it a shot. Okay, so for a polynomial, p of x, the value of p of 3 is negative 2. Which of the following must be true about p of x? So in here, um, this gets into something that a lot of students either may not have seen or um, may not have fully uh, interpreted what it means. Okay, so what we have here is, I'll start off with this. If this was said that p of 3 is 0, that leads us down a quick thing that you should all know that this would tell me that, okay, 3 is a 0 of p, which means if 3 is a 0, then x minus 3 is a factor. The zeros and the factors are tied together. Okay? We don't have um, a zero. We have a negative two here. So um, we need to figure out what that means. And what that means for us is when we factor things out, we're trying to divide. So um, we're trying to divide out something. So in this case, I'm trying to divide out x minus three. And the fact that p of 3 is negative 2 means that after I divide out the negative 3, I'll be left with negative 2. So that means I have um, something. Let's call it q. That's probably not a good color. Let's go to this color. So let's call it q, a different polynomial. And let's just say q of x um, has a factor of x minus 3. So that means that we can divide q of x by x minus 3 with no remainder. But if I make my q of 3 very carefully, I can actually say, okay, there could be, there, there is some q of 3, q of x, not all q of x, but some q of x where I'll have this polynomial, which will be q of x. That's what would work out perfectly if I divided by x minus 3, but I actually get a minus 2, so I actually have minus 2 more. And so what that means then is, so I'll write, I'll write there exists some q, where q is a factor of x minus 3, such that this is the case. Because I know that I want this remainder of negative 2, and this divides equally. And so that would mean that p of 3 equals negative 2, because q of 3 will be 0, I'd be left with negative 2. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. If I'm, I'm concerned where if you didn't understand this problem before I started, you probably still don't understand it. Uh, look into it. There's a ton of, ton of information about polynomials. The more important thing to tie in is if I had something like p of 5 equals 0, I know that x minus 5 is a factor. So this is the type of thing that would give me answer choice A. If I know x minus 2 is a factor, so if I know that b is correct, that means that p of changing the sign, p of positive 2, is 0. So these are more likely to show up, but sometimes you can get this um, remainder coming out as well. 
All right, last problem for this video. Okay, so we have what looks to be a parabola. It is a parabola, now that I notice we have a quadratic equation or quadratic function. It says, which of the following is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph um, shown in the xy plane above, um, from which the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants of the equation? So I'm thinking, let me see. So in here, similar to the last problem, I have a zero at negative 3 and a 0 at 5, which means that x plus 3 and x minus 5 have to be factors. Now, this doesn't guarantee that this is my answer. It's actually not. But one more thing, I notice it goes through this point, 0, negative 15. And if I put the 0 in here, I get negative 15. So you might be tempted to say, hey, A looks good. It's not the answer. The This one, I want to have the the form where the vertex can be identified. And so I need vertex form of the equation. So first off, let me knock this one off. This The signs are all wrong. It should be a plus 3 and a minus 5 if I had factored form or zeros form. Not what we're looking for, and this is wrong even if it were what we were looking for. But vertex form is y equals a x minus h squared plus k. And something I stress to my students is whenever I see this, it's pretty much almost always the case that this means I'm switching some signs. So in our case, we have this vertex here, and I'm going to sort of hazard guess that it looks like 1, negative 16, which is the case. But if I put negative 15 or negative 17, I could probably figure it out from there. And so I need to identify that this is my form that I want. My vertex is here, so I should have an x minus 1 squared minus 16. The others have been eliminated. And now I know this is my answer, but just to check to make sure, notice this has an a, right? The simplest way to figure out what the a is is to just go to another point. So if I consider, let's say, this point 5, 0, so if I didn't know what this a was, I could actually put in the information about 5, 0, and that would give me 0 equals a times 5 minus 1 squared minus 16. 5 minus 1 squared is 16, so I get 0 equals 16a minus 16. You add 16, divide by 16, you get a equals 1 anyway. So it's still clearly the exact, an exact or correct answer. Okay, I hope that helped out. We'll continue with these videos tomorrow.